In a moment, I'll be introducing Keir, but first of all, I want to welcome Aletha Adu from the Daily Mirror, who will be the chair for our session with Keir, and will be taking questions from all of you after we've heard his speech, which, as you know, uh, was trailed in the press overnight. Um, we're delighted that he'll be talking on that critical issue for the Labour Party, an area of real strength, and that's the NHS. Would you join me now in welcoming to the stage the leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, it's really fantastic to see you all in person. It's great to be here in person after everything that we've been through. The last time I think I was here for the Fabians event uh, in person was two years ago. Um, and if I remember rightly, we just had the hustings for the leadership in Liverpool. We'd just kicked off the leadership race for the Labour Party. And I was up in Liverpool, and I came down here by, I think, Andrew, by about four or five o'clock. Um, and it was really fantastic to be with you then. And wow, a lot has happened in the two years since I last addressed you in person. So it's really, really fantastic uh, to be here. And I feel I'm back home with you. So thank you so much for being here this morning. I really look forward to this session. I hope you really look forward to the whole day. Two weeks ago, um, I set out the terms of Labour's new contract with the British people to provide people with the security, the prosperity and the respect that they deserve. Today, I'll concentrate on an aspect of security as I set out Labour's contract for better health. And two years ago, as we all know, the pandemic struck. And as I speak to you this morning, 150,000 of our fellow citizens have lost their lives. I'm convinced that a swifter response by the government could have reduced that number. Yeah. COVID affected every aspect of our lives. Children couldn't go to school, imagine that. Parents couldn't get to work. We couldn't see our families. And COVID is still affecting so many of us. And the bravery and the skill of health workers is helping to see us through. The least we can do to show the respect that they are owed is to ensure that we protect the National Health Service. The National Health Service cannot look after us if we do not look after it. Now, this is a political crusade for us in the Labour Party. The NHS is Labour's proudest achievement in office. As Bevan said when he introduced the National Health Service Act, the NHS would lift the shadow for millions of homes. But this is also a personal crusade for me. My wife works in our local hospital just up the road. My sister is a care worker. And my mum was a nurse in the NHS. She took great pride in what she did all of her working life. But she was also, sadly, a long-term patient of the NHS. I spent a lot of time as a child visiting my mum in hospital. I have never forgotten, and I never will forget, the care my mum received, the respect with which she was treated. I want that level of care for everyone. We all need the security of knowing that the NHS is there for us when we need it. That will be what my contract will offer. And I can't stress how badly it's needed. Rather than concentrating on getting through the pandemic and bringing down waiting lists, this self-indulgent Tory party is having a fight about a leader who they should have known from the start is not fit for office. Boris Johnson is too preoccupied defending his rule-breaking. And as day follows night, when it comes to the National Health Service, you can never trust the Tories. <laughs> it is 
we're, we're witnessing every day the broken spectacle of a Prime Minister mired in deceit and deception and unable to lead. But whilst the Tories bicker and fight each other on WhatsApp, I want to look to the future because the NHS faces new challenges. We're an ageing population. That fact was brutally exposed by a virus that hit the oldest the hardest. We must devise new methods of care to help with long-term conditions. We need to think about mental as well as physical health. And we need to think not just about how we treat patients, but how we prevent them from falling ill in the first place. But before we can think about the future, we have to attend to the present. When Labour left office 12 years ago, the Conservatives inherited a strong NHS. Waiting times were the shortest on record. The overall mortality rate for cancer had fallen by 22%. That proud record of ours puts the failure of the Tory years into sharp relief. Today, NHS waiting lists are the highest since records began, the highest. Six million people in England, that's more than one in nine, are waiting for consultations and operations. I'd imagine that most people in this room know someone who's either waiting for an operation on an eye, a hip, or a knee, or someone who is worried about the symptoms they're experiencing but can't get an appointment to see anyone. The Health Secretary has admitted that this backlog is going to get worse. And it's not good enough to blame all of this on COVID. This mess has been much longer in the making. And this government has to bear the responsibility. Waiting lists were the highest on record before the virus arrived. Average life expectancy has stalled after decades of improvement. And the health gap between the poorest and the wealthiest parts of the country has increased. And why are we in this mess? Why have we got to the point where the NHS itself is in critical condition? It's not hard to work out what's gone wrong. The NHS went into the pandemic short of 100,000 staff. In social care, there are 112,000 vacancies. Even before the pandemic, patients could not be discharged from hospital beds because there were too few places in social care and too few staff. The consequences of 12 years of Tory failure are coming in. This is what always happens with Tory governments. It always ends up this way. And I'm afraid it may well get worse yet. The Conservatives said that they would train more GPs. The Health Secretary now admits he's not on track to meet that commitment. These broken promises cost lives. If there is no GP to go to, people will end up going to hospital. A&E departments become the front door of health and social care. So the first task of a Labour government would be to clear up the mess the Tories have made of the NHS. The last Labour go government brought waiting times down from 18 months to 18 weeks. We will need to do the same again. People who can afford it are paying to go private. Those who can't afford it are stuck in the queue, waiting for months, if not years, in pain and agony. That can't be right. That's just as much about fairness as it is about health. People should get treated faster via the NHS. But it's outrageous that people are being forced to spend money in the private sector simply because the Tories have run down the public sector. That is why the Labour government I lead will invest properly to bring down waiting lists and we would start by recruiting, training, and crucially retaining the staff that we need. We have a five-point plan for the transformation of social care. We would make sure that every older and disabled person who needs care and support can get it when 
and where they need it. We would act on the principles of prevention and early intervention, an approach that we call home first. We would give disabled adults choice and control over their support. We would establish a new deal for care workers to ensure they get the job security they deserve and the rewards that they have earned. And we would establish a new partnership with families to ensure they don't put themselves at risk for looking after the people that they love. And as we repair and strengthen, we need to learn to live with COVID so that people can live their lives as normal, supported by a strong healthcare system. I don't want the government ever again to have to place tough restrictions on our lives, our livelihoods, and our liberties. So I'm delighted to say that Wes Streeting, the Shadow Health Secretary, will be setting out the details of our plan for living with COVID in the days to come. But the job will not be done once we've dealt with the immediate crisis. It's much bigger than that because the health challenges are changing all of the time. In the first half of the 20th century, polio, rubella, mumps, tuberculosis, and diphtheria were among the leading causes of death. The NHS's treat and cure model proved a remarkable success. So in the second half of the 20th century, those conditions were effectively wiped out. In 1950, the average life expectancy was 69. Today, it's 81. People live for much longer now with conditions that once would have killed them, which they would not have lived long enough to contract. Many of the pressures on the NHS today are the result of our successes. I'm delighted we're an aging society. It's wonderful that so many people get to live for so long. But an older society needs a different health system. One that is as much about prevention as it is about cure. That is a bit less about the community hospital and a bit more about the community. A health system that's a bit less about the system and a lot more about the patient. Many people feel insecure about whether the NHS will be there for them in the future, if you can believe it. I understand that anxiety. I share it. In fact, it makes me more than anxious. It makes me angry. Angry that an important national institution is being allowed to decline. Angry that this government has the opportunity to do something good, but instead it's doing nothing and angry that so many people who could be helped are suffering. The shadow that Bevan said was lifting from so many homes is falling again. So let me tell you what we would do to lift it. How we would protect an NHS free at the point of use. How we would secure health care for all. Now, it's obvious that the health service and the NHS need more money. But that's not all it needs. Don't think that the NHS is automatically protected when more investment goes in. The NHS also needs reform so that it works in a different way. We set the NHS up in 1948 to treat the diseases of 1948. When we were last in government, we started to reform the NHS. So it was pointed more towards the patient so that it answered the needs of the time. That renewal process has stalled because this government simply doesn't care enough if the NHS falls behind. So it will fall to us again to establish the changes that the NHS needs if it's to remain the great institution it's been for more than seven decades. Uh, let me give you a flavour of the change I have in mind. It's been said many times that the NHS is a national sickness service rather than a truly national health service. I see health as about more than hospitals and surgeries, 
as important, of course, that they are. It's about the towns and cities where we grow up, the food that we eat, our access to green spaces. Health is about the air that we breathe. It's estimated that every year in the UK, air pollution kills tens of thousands of people. So we would introduce a new Clean Air Act to tackle this silent killer. Poor health affects our earnings, our relationships, and our sense of purpose. And its effects are measured in lower productivity and higher crime, in family breakdown, and increased loneliness and depression. So Labour would make well-being matter as much as national economic output. Now, my preferred definition of well-being has been given by Angus Deaton, the winner of the Nobel Prize. All the things that are good for a person that make for a good life. This is about treating people with basic respect. So we would expect the Treasury under a Labour government to weigh every pound it spends, not just for its effect on national income, but also for its effect on national well-being. A good example of a policy for well-being is supporting mental health. A Labour government would treat mental health as seriously as physical health. We would guarantee mental health treatment in less than a month. We'll recruit 8,500 more mental health professionals to support a million more people a year. Every school will have specialist support. Every community will have an open access mental health hub for young people. And under Labour, spending on mental health will never be allowed to fall. Stress, depression and anxiety account for 18 million workdays lost every year. 18 million. We know that the more secure people feel about their jobs, the less likely they are to suffer from stress and be absent from work. So we would expect employers to take well-being at work seriously. Under Labour's New Deal for Working People, people will have the security of knowing that they have the right to paid leave for family emergencies. Security and respect at work is good for workers. It's good for families. And a healthier workforce is good for the economy. That's why I envisage a health service in the future, which is under less strain because we have a healthier population. Let me give you an example of prevention in action. In the early 2000s, every pub you walked in was filled with smoke. More than a quarter of all British adults smoke cigarettes. Labour banned smoking indoors, as well as uh, a cigarette advertising, and now just 14% of adults smoke. Reducing the number of smokers prevented countless people from needing treatment on the NHS, and it freed up beds in the NHS. Just think of what more we could do. We know, for example, that high blood pressure and cholesterol hit the poorest the hardest. The consequences are cancer, heart failures, and strokes. Much of this can be prevented, and usually, the earlier you act, the better. A community in which all are respected is itself a source of better health, because the connections we have with our communities are a form of security. Those bonds have been eroded over 12 years of Tory rule. The social clubs, the community centres, sports clubs, green spaces, secure homes and safe streets. These are all health policies. As a really good example from Wigan, like most local authorities, the Labour Council in Wigan saw its budget slashed. Its leadership responded with great imagination. They decided to let the people decide the future of their own borough. The people wrote the contract the Wigan deal, which set out what both the people and the council would do. And already, life expectancy in Wigan has increased. 
on average, more than two years of good health have been added to people's lives. And early deaths from heart disease have fallen faster than anywhere else in the country. That's what labor in power can do. That is, in fact, what labor is doing in many councils all over the country and what the Labour government in Wales is doing too. I want the opportunity to add to this through central government because the range of what we can do is quite mind-boggling. I was really struck by the power of progress recently. Many years ago, my mum had her knees and her hips replaced when she was in her 20s and 30s. As was typical at the time, it took six months for my mum to recover from the operation. She couldn't get out of bed for weeks. By contrast, recently, a friend of mine had a hip operation, and he was back on his feet the same day. The improvement in care in our lifetimes has been amazing. That's what makes me optimistic about the NHS. That's why for all the neglect of the Tories, all the big challenges we face, I'm still upbeat about its future. We are only beginning to explore what we might achieve. There are technologies that can provide us with early warnings about the diseases we might be vulnerable to. Hospital at home technologies allow patients to track and report their conditions with remote supervision. We have access to the most incredible array of information about ourselves. Everyday algorithms are predicting our shopping choices Imagine how information like that could be gathered and the insights used for our health. We can connect people with information and choices about their own health, which give people greater security and control of their health. And that, in turn, makes us healthier, happier, and more prosperous. Sadly, the NHS is not getting better at the moment. There is no plan. There's no strategic thinking. If the NHS is going to continue to look after us, then it's got to change. And only the Labour Party has the permission to make that change. We founded the NHS. We understand it. We have reason to be thankful for it. I know I do. But we're not out of the woods yet. The pandemic is by no means over. And we should not make the mistake of thinking that once we get through COVID, all will be well with the NHS. It won't. We have a government that we can't trust with a precious national resource. Nearly three quarters of a century ago, this party put into practice one of its cherished principles. Healthcare collectively provided, free at the point of use, to embody the idea of equality. It was... It, was a, it was a powerful idea then, and it's a powerful idea now. And every generation has to find its own way to carry that tradition on. Because to prosper, we need the security of good health. And this is the health contract that we will sign with the British nation. Item one, to tackle the immediate crisis to bring down waiting times by recruiting, training, and retaining the staff that we need. Item two, to make mental health as important as physical health. And item three, to shift the focus of healthcare to prevention as well as to cure, to build the communities that care for us, to ensure that the NHS thrives, to look after the NHS so it can look after us. Thank you very much. We're now going to go to questions. Uh, and Aletha is going to lead on that for us. Thank you so much, Keir, for that really strong speech. I know it spoke to many people in this room and to those listening remotely. Um, you rightly touched on health in this new contract you're setting out with the British people. 
It's an important time for politics, but also for our physical and mental health. We've got youngsters, you know, elderly people, middle-aged people, people of all demographics, backgrounds, rich and poor, suffering in silence because they don't want to come forward and talk about their mental health needs in fear that they will be overwhelming and already overwhelmed NHS. So could you tell us, you know, how soon would you start rolling out community support hubs in every community? And also, what would you say to the people suffering in silence? Well, look, I think on mental health, firstly, I think the commitment that we're making this morning, loud and clear, that mental health should be treated in the same way and equally with physical health is very, very important. I think before we went into the pandemic, we underestimated the mental health impact in our society. Um, and, the COVID, uh, and COVID, the pandemic, has made it worse uh, and exacerbated the problem. Um, and I was really struck through the pandemic um, by the increase in mental health, whether that's um, isolation, anxiety, etc. Not just as I had expected in people who were shielding and therefore more on their own than might otherwise have been, but actually I was most struck, I think, by the impact on young people. The number of accounts I had of young people who, with increased levels of mental health and with stress. And I can't, hadn't quite expected that. I thought um, that in a sense they would be the most resilient and it was very interesting to see that happen. I think, by the way, that um, the scandal of Partygate, for want of a better word, but um, what's happened in recent weeks where it's become obvious that whilst the vast majority of the British public were obeying the laws that the government made, um, the government and the Prime Minister were parting in Downing Street. I think that's added to mental health stress because so many people are now asking themselves, well, why on earth did I do that then? Whilst they were doing what they were doing. And so I think that this, that, that, you know, before the pandemic we had mental health issues. I think they've got worse in the pandemic in greater ways than we've really understood, um, particularly young people. I think they're greater in workforces. I think in places like the NHS where the strain has been huge, we've probably got backed up mental health problems. I think the last few weeks in relation to Partygate has just made the situation worse, which is why it's so important we made those concrete offers in relation to mental health. Um, and frankly, the sooner we get into power and are able to do something about it, the better. Thank you. Right, we've got a question from David Wood from ITV. Uh, David. Yes, absolutely. Um, when we collectively asked the nation to act in a particular way, it was very important that we acted in the same way as the rest of the nation. What we've now got to a situation where you've got a Prime Minister um, who has lost the moral authority to lead. And just, just when you need, because we're not out of the pandemic, a government that has that moral authority to lead, we've lost it with this Prime Minister. And I don't just mean the fact that he now admits that he was at parties in Downing Street. I mean that what he said along the way, when I first challenged the Prime Minister, in relation to these allegations back in December, he stood at the dispatch box and said, I've been assured there were no parties. So his first defence was there weren't any. And then, remember, that video came out um, and showing the rehearsal of um, a press conference and what you might have to say if somebody said, were you at the party? Um, and when I put that to the Prime Minister, his response to the dispatch box was to say, Effectively, that's the first I knew of it. I'm furious about these parties of which I knew nothing. And then we had another go last Wednesday uh, where I put to him um, the invitation um, and the fact that he was at one of the parties. And he then changed his defence to say, um, I was at the party, but I didn't realise it was a party. <laughs> but he went on to say, and this bit's really important, he went on to say, I now wish I had got all the staff in from Downing Street. So he's giving the impression that he appreciated back in 2020 that he was at a, finally what he twigged of sort of wading through the bottles and the food. He finally, <laughs> finally twigged he might be at a party, having sort of said hello to everybody with a glass of wine. Uh, this must be a party. And, and then he says at the dispatch box, well, I wish I'd sort of got everybody in because I'd obviously stumbled on this party in my own back garden. Absolute <laughs> horror. 
<laughs> and after half an hour, I'd worked out it was a party, so I should have stopped it happening. Well, how does that fit with his first defence, which was the word no parties? <laughs> or his second defence, that in December 2021, he was furious about he just found out about them. If he's now saying back in 2020, he found out after 25 minutes it was a party, um, and he should have got everybody in. And I think that, that has hugely undermined, um, you know, uh, his moral authority to lead. Uh, and I'll add this, because it, you know, the moral authority matters in relation to enforcing the COVID rules, but we've got other massive challenges facing this country, massive challenges. We've got a prime minister who is absent, you know, he's literally in hiding at the moment, um, and unable to lead. And so um, that's why I've concluded that um, he's got to go. Um, and, and of course there's a party advantage in him going, but actually, it's now in the national interest that he goes. So it's very important now that um, the Tory party does what it needs to do and gets rid of him. Thank you, Peter. Sophie Wingate, PPA. set out your plan to reform the NHS. Um, in the context of the cost of living crisis, would a Labour government repeal the national insurance hike that's due in April to pay for, the social, for social care and the NHS backlog? Uh, we voted against the national insurance uh, rise last year because um, we do not think that the right way to pay for the health service, or social care for that matter, is to hammer working people with an unfair tax, particularly at the moment. At the moment, if you think about what most people are most concerned about, we've got inflation predicted to go to 6%. We've got prices going up, whether that's fuel or food, energy bills going through the roof. Um, and at that point, the government decides to hit them at the same time with national insurance rises, which for working families is, is like a double whammy. And that's why we voted against it. But we did set out the alternative, which is that we would raise that money um, by looking to those with the broadest shoulders. And in particular, we would look at um, people who are making their money from stocks and shares and dividends, etc., as well as in the ordinary um, way. So we would take a completely different approach. And that is the difference between us and the Tories here. They've gone straight for a tax on working people at a time when people are already massively squeezed. Um, and, I, you know, I hate to think what's going to happen uh, in April when this tax, um, you know, the national insurance uh, really kicks in, because people are struggling at the moment. So we would uh, tax differently on broader shoulders, but we've also set out other proposals. Um, last week, Rachel Reeves um, and Ed Miliband set out our policy in relation to energy prices to say we would actually have a windfall tax on the oil and gas industries in the North Sea to bring down those prices, um, those bills right now. So, um, you know, the government is hiding, it's out of ideas, it's out of contact now. Um, we are, uh, meanwhile, getting on with the job of providing real answers to the problems that people are facing day in and day out. Thank you. And now I'm going to open this up to the floor, take some questions from you guys who are here with us before I answer those questions from people who couldn't join us. Um, so if I could speak to the gentleman on the left in the red tie there. Great, good to see you again, Keir, and really enjoyed your speech. I wanted to uh, ask you a question. You, you, uh, the government has been having uh, all kinds of problems with waste of money, and there's been a real interest in Labour's plans under your leadership of uh, making sure that we've got a, an eye on costs and doing value for money. You mentioned today the interest in having well-being being a very important part of thinking about health policy and how it integrates with seemingly every area of policy as well. In addition to thinking about cost-benefit analysis and value for money, will different policy areas be thinking about how does this policy and areas beyond health contribute to national well-being? Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. Really good to see you. We said that we would have an office for value for money to make sure that every pound is spent properly. And, and don't we need it after the last two or three years? Um, because you've seen this toxic combination of crony contracts, contracts going to people who've got a connection with the Conservative Party or the landlord of the ex-health secretary, coupled with pure waste, billions of pounds of waste um, on contracts um, that have never delivered, and no appetite by the government to claw any of that money back, 
no, no systems in place to do anything about it. Billions and billions of pounds that have been wasted. Um, and so we need that office for value for money, um, and we will put it in place um, as soon as we get into government. On your second point, we will, and this is what I was saying in the speech, we will measure the impact of our policies on well-being as well as their economic impact. And that's really important because governments traditionally will look at the economic impact of what they're proposing, but not the well-being. How does this impact on people's physical health, their mental health, um, their sense of security, respect and prosperity? And so we will have both of those things. And I think that will um, go a long way to changing the lives and the experiences of millions of people up and down the country. Thank you. Can I hear from the girl with the green blazer and her mask on you? Thank you, Keir. That was a brilliant speech, and it was really great to hear about your plans on health and well-being and protecting and strengthening the NHS. Um, I wanted to ask what your plan is for Labour in government to prepare for the next pandemic and make the country and help make the world more resilient against other global crises. I think it's very important that we have a plan for the next pandemic. And what we're streeting is going to do is to set out our plan for living with COVID. And part of that touches on that very question, which is really important, which is how do we make sure that next time we're more prepared? We need a pandemic plan um, to deal with um, a possible further pandemic. But it's not just a pandemic plan. We need a resilience plan for the NHS because what we had was a pandemic hitting us without the government having prepared for a pandemic. But at the same time, we had a, an NHS that was run down. You know, the 100,000 vacancies in the NHS, the under-resourcing, under-funding, under-staffing, meant that when the pandemic hit, it hit an health service that was already um, struggling um, and, you know, with waiting lists, etc. So, yes, we need a pandemic plan. Yes, that will be in what Wes is going to set out. But we also need to be absolutely clear, we need a resilient NHS, which is why this staff issue is so, so important. Talk to any of the staff in the NHS now, and it's that... Uh, impact on them on recruitment and retaining staff that is huge. I was speaking to staff at UCLH only yesterday from different areas, different sectors, different specialisms, different jobs, and all of them said the same thing about the huge impact on them uh, of the understaffing that's been going on for years and years and years. And that's why what I said in my speech is so important. What Labour does in power is to take care of the NHS and tackle these issues what the Tories do over and over again is to undo all that good work and leave us in a worse state than when we started. Um, and, you know, we saw that with the last Labour government, and I'm afraid we're going to see it with the next Labour government, but that's why the priority I set out today was so important as to uh, what we intend to do and our determination to do it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, can we hear from the lady at the back? She's got a black blazer on and a gold dress. There you are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I'm really touched that uh, you focused on health. Um, as a governor of uh, Guy's and St Thomas's, it really resonates with me. Um, I'm interested to know about the financing of these, uh, these plans, and particularly um, any kind of tax levy that, uh, you know, is, is in the plan. Uh, certainly, I think that the country is, is ready for increased spending, so I'd be very interested to know where that's coming from. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Can I just say, on a personal level, thanks to Guy's and St Thomas's. They were the hospitals where my mum was looked after for so many years, um, particularly Guy's. So um, I know that hospital very... I was born at Guy's, but it was where my mum was treated. So I, I will always, that will always have a special, special place um, in my heart. In terms of um, paying for this, um, we will... You know, Our plan is, of course, to set out... Um, in terms how we will pay for everything as we go into government. And Rachel Reeves has already set out the sort of rules that she will put into place because we do need to make sure the NHS is funded properly. It's a very important principle. It's been underfunded. Um, and we need to be clear about um, investing properly in the NHS. It's not all about funding. And one of the points I'm trying to make this morning is that actually just putting more money in on its own, which is needed isn't going to fix all the problems. We've got to think about health differently. Um, and some of the measures that I've set out this morning, I hope in the long run, will actually save money. Because I'm really struck by 
um, you know, the role that prevention can play or early intervention um, can play in relation to um, health care. And so some of these measures will actually save money in the long run. Um, but we will set out those plans um, to make sure that our NHS is properly funded, properly resourced, um, and that the staff actually um, uh, have sufficient numbers that they're not exhausted and under the strain. That and you'll have this at Guy's and St Thomas's, just as the same as UCLH or wherever, which is staff working in institutions they're absolutely proud of, doing an incredible job, but feeling um, undervalued, actually, and underappreciated are the words that come through time and time again. So thank you very much. Um, and here we've got a question from somebody who couldn't make it here with us. Um, his name is Dr. Peter Burke. And he says, many of us were disappointed to hear you use the words make Brexit work. He says, this is the time when Labour needs to capitalise on the failure of Brexit. So he asked you, can you see if the party is at risk of losing people who are feeling politically homeless, excuse me, particularly you know, pro-EU supporters? Yeah, look... Um, whatever way we all voted in 2016 in the referendum, we've now left the EU. Um, and we've got a choice. We either do what the government's doing, which is say, well, we'll get Brexit done. Technically, we've left. But we've got a really poor deal. And the, the problem's becoming increasingly obvious um, you know, day by day, whether that's the impact on trade, whether it's on Northern Ireland, um, or whether it's our relations with the EU, which are very important, particularly not just on the trade issues, but when we think about what's happening on the border in Ukraine. Our relations with our partners in Europe matter when we have global threats that we all uh, face. So we either take that approach, which is the Johnson approach, which is get Brexit done, doesn't much matter what the deal is, even if it has an impact on our economy, our security. And then, you know, as he always does, lie and pretend it isn't what it is. I mean, the, the protocol in Northern Ireland, I mean, he negotiated it. Now he's scratching his head saying, how on earth did anyone agree to this? <laughs> the alternative is, the alternative is we say we've got to make it work. We are out. We've got to make it work now. And that's what I mean by make Brexit work, which is to deal with those problems, to make sure that we are confident in our place um, in the world, um, and so when we come into government, we will make Brexit work. And at my CBI speech, I set out some of how we would do that, and I intend to set out more of that. But, um, you know, lamenting the decision in 2016 is, is, is history. Um, I'm afraid um, we are out, but now we have to make it work, and that's what we will do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. I think we're out of time for questions today. Thank you all very much. Really fantastic to see you. Thank you. See you next time.